Hey guys, I'm Jerry. I'm Sierra. We're ladies. And we tangent. What's up, everyone? Hello. How you doing? How you doing? Um, not well. No. All right. <laughs> I mean, fine. Yeah. Um, hey, here's the thing. You know what? Someone mentioned to me the other day that I say here's the thing a lot. And I was like, well, here's the thing. Okay. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I, uh, that's the one thing I don't like about the podcast uh, is that it's really opened my eyes to the things I say frequently way too much yeah, yeah. i'm but like i gotta switch up that vocab mm -mm. no fuck them no, that's fine <laughs> got kahlua in this one. there's so much kahlua in this coffee sierra had a nightmare a stress dream I we did. both had stress dreams about each other last night I, which is kind of crazy yeah i wonder why we were connected <laughs> not like that. No, not like that. that. Sierra's making scissoring <laughs> shapes with her fingers Thank for those you. audio listeners. At first, I just was like two peas in a pod, and then I, I just slipped into <laughs> it. Isn't that how it always it happens? Really, it's just you know? normally an accident. <laughs> yeah. Um, but she had a dream that um, I was just so very tired. And um, one of my biggest pet peeves about Corey is that. When he drinks, just talk shit on him. He's I'm going to. Cares. And he literally said the other day, he's like, "What do you expect me to listen to your podcast like on the way home when I talk to you every day?" And I was like, ah, ha, ha, "I'm gonna fucking talk so much shit." <laughs> <laughs> now you don't listen. Oh, so now I know for sure you don't listen. But he can fall asleep. It's not even just when he's drinking, but it does happen more frequently when he drinks. But whenever he worked midnights yeah. and was tired all the fucking time, this happened. He, I've never met somebody who like. Have you ever seen babies in like high chairs just falling asleep as yeah. they're eating? That's Me at Corey. A movie theater. Yes, well, same. Yeah. One of our first, I don't know, first dates, like movie wise, he mm -hmm. fell asleep in the theater, and I was like, "This is fucking so weird." Do I wake him up or what do I do? No, please. If uh, as someone as an avid sleeper <laughs> in a movie theater, do not wake don't. us. Yeah, I didn't. No, he missed the whole fucking movie, and I yeah. had a great I time by myself. I have paid nine dollars to go and sleep. <laughs> In a movie theater, like, yeah. more times than I'd like to admit. That's exactly what he did, but I ate all the popcorn, so I was yeah. like, fuck it. Sometimes, oh, there's a movie theater. Um, this was Shane and I's last date before the shutdown. <laughs> was a movie theater, like, that was a dine-in. Ooh, yeah. Oh, you yeah. Told me about they that. have, like, TV tray type situations, <gasps> and then they just, like, bring you food. I'll it tell you what, that w that is a dream, because there's mm -hmm. nothing I like to do more when I watch something than eat. <laughs> yeah. I feel, it's like a hand-to-mouth. Yes. That's why... I, when I was trying to lose weight back in mm -hmm. the day, right? I would just eat like sunflower seeds because I knew they weren't like terrible and they take you longer. Mm. And that way I'm not like, because before I would just make a full friggin' meal to eat. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, but Corey falls asleep yes. while I'm talking to him, while he's eating. Literally, I had to make sure he didn't choke on Taco Bell the other night. Is he in narcolepsy? I don't know, but it's, he's like, I have a video I'll show you. Of him eating <laughs> yeah. asleep? Uh, yep. I love to take videos of him when he's asleep because he'll talk to me too. Yeah. But his eyes are closed and I'm like, you're sleeping right now. He's like, I'm looking at you. I'm like, your eyes are fucking closed. <laughs> I'm sober. Yeah. But anyways, so my stress dream was that you were doing that while I was telling the story yeah. on the podcast and I have to keep being like, <laughs> hey, bitch. Hey. <laughs> Wake up. You want to be here with me? Yeah. So luckily you have. Will you just be with me? <laughs> and I, yes, I remember at one point I was like, uh, we shut the camera off and I go, hey, I don't know if you need to like drink some tequila, but I need you to wake up and give me more than you're giving me. You know what'd be funny is if you actually ever spoke to me like that. <laughs> I wouldn't have that something. I was speaking to you in my dreams like I talked to Corey, <laughs> okay. which is why I was like, this is about well, Corey. This is not even about Jerry. <laughs> well, when you told me about your dream earlier, I was like, Never in my <laughs> life have you ever been like, listen, bitch, you need to get Wake it together. the fuck up. You never. <laughs> no. But I do with Corey, mostly because I know yeah. when he's at that point, he won't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and if he does, who cares? Fuck. I'm right. Yeah. You should wake the fuck up. Yeah. You're going to choke on that case of Rito. <laughs> um, my stress dream was that I was pregnant. And if you aren't caught all the... Why are you clapping? No one's clapping for that. Oh, boo. 
There you go. So I don't just don't want to be alone in it. <laughs> oh well, sorry. Oh. I already I did my time. Okay, okay, that's true. For those of you who like either are starting to listen this way or are listening out of order and don't know, Shane has a vasectomy. Mm. So me being pregnant would be a surprise <laughs> to everyone. But I had a dream that I was pregnant and it was a girl, and all of you guys were so excited that it was Jerry and Sierra two point I know. So it's funny that like my stress dream just was like that I was experiencing your reality, <laughs> right? Which is stressful. Yeah, That's, I have stress dreams about that, but it's real life. Yeah, <laughs> it's well, called stress being awake. I think <laughs> it's just called existence yeah. at this point. Well, that's. This is a Tangents and True Crime episode. You know that because of the title. Yeah. <laughs> but we are going to like take a minute in the intro to do a bit of a mental health check-in. Yeah. Um, Because, you know, May was Mental Health Awareness Month and we completely didn't address it. <laughs> like at but, all. But we also address mental health in literally every other yeah. one that we do. Yeah, so we kind of felt like... We address it all the time. Obviously, it's important to acknowledge it and... and to get people talking about it, but that's why we kind of talk about, to talk it, about all it all the time, yeah. <laughs> like constantly. Yeah. But, but yeah, we're both experiencing, um, stress. Yeah. And it's, it's something that we wanted to just bring up on here because as much fun as it is to laugh with you guys and, and drink my <laughs> decaf coffee full of Kahlua yeah. or my margaritas, um, Outside of the podcast, outside outside of the like hours that we spend with you guys, like there are several other days, many other hours that have been kind of rough. Yeah. And part of me and Sierra and I talked about this earlier, feel like sometimes we don't always share that. We we share things almost after we've processed them. Yeah. Not so much while we're going through as it. we're experiencing them. And and Sometimes that's because we're not ready to talk about it. Right. And and like we've said before, people aren't entitled to your journey at every moment and you don't have to share everything. Even us who put a, literally everything out on the table. Yeah. Um, it's up to us what we share and what we don't share. We Sometimes I feel like I have to share it all because I've built this like idea around myself of being so transparent. But mm -hmm. at the same time, if I do while I'm going through it, it's tough <laughs> yeah it's dangerous yeah. sometimes um but it also can feel inauthentic to us sometimes to not share these things yeah. and um to make it seem like we're so for me I feel like when I talk about certain things I appear strong and mm -hmm. we appear hopeful and that's awesome but we're not always strong and or hopeful like while <laughs> no. we're going through it and so um I saw something on our fandoms page that someone had posted and it made me really emotional and she was talking about how she was supposed to be graduating and she wasn't graduating because she had experienced um, some medical issues. Aww. And so because of what had happened to her, she was not able to graduate. And so she was watching her friends graduate <sighs> Been there. and she was having this you know, these, this emotional duality of like feeling excited for her friends, but also feeling grief for herself yep. and just navigating that. Navigating that alone could be so hard. I was so grateful it is so hard. that she was able to talk about it in on that platform yep. and have other people come to her aid and her support. Um, but like Sierra and I are also experiencing that exact same thing yes right now not not necessarily with school but like there are so many wonderful things happening while simultaneously we are struggling yeah and we just want to be transparent with you yeah. guys about that because i don't ever want to feel like there's literally so many good things happening for us that yeah. it almost feels like um toxic positivity again where yeah. it's like why can't you just be grateful for what is going right yeah. why are you dwelling and this on is what's no one saying wrong? that to us this is it, us this saying is it to ourselves <laughs> yeah. this is literally in my head so that's i'm having a tough time with that part of the struggle because mm -hmm. it's like look at what all the good things why are you complaining your life people would kill for right right now and i'm struggling because I know that so many people have said, like, you gave me strength, you gave me inspiration. And I'm like, well, if I'm 
down and I'm down bad, then yeah. how do I do that? For I people? feel like a, a phony and I feel like, how am I supposed to help people when I don't even know how to help myself? Yep. So, um, I feel like I'm letting people down when I'm struggling Yeah. where you feel like you're ungrateful yeah. when you're struggling. So yeah. if we're, we just want to kind of be open about those things that we're experiencing right now in case anyone else is also experiencing those things or mm-hmm. finding it hard to, you know, be happy. And do you want to share? Yeah, I'll, show, yeah, I'll talk about okay. it. I didn't know if you wanted to talk about the merge thing first before we did that. Oh, Why oh. this whole kind of... Thing oh yeah, came up. So uh, I was talking to Sierra earlier because um, I want to. We want to take responsibility for something, and that is that we have talked about merch, and we are seeing you guys ask for merch, and we want to do that. Um, Our base, like, come back when we talk about it. Is we're working on it. Yeah. Um, which I didn't realize until Jerry brought it up could be kind of a bad thing to say. Yeah, only because it's ambiguous. Yeah, where's where's the timeline? Yeah, and like yeah. Wh- for how long are you working on it? Yeah. And really, how hard are you working at working on it? You yeah, know what yeah, I'm yeah. saying? Because right now, I really was trying to work yeah. on it. It's a fucking lot. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing is like we are we're a two person team right here. Well, three if you count Shane. Yeah, <laughs> but it, that's literally it. Yeah. We don't have any outside people. So like people with big merch and podcasts and My Favorite Murder and things like that that mm-hmm. I know really do a lot of merch, yeah. they have full-on teams Team, yeah. of people that help them with that. And we have never done anything like that before. So yeah. trying to figure out how to do it and give you guys the best quality stuff for the the sites that I was looking at would be the easiest way for us to do it. Yeah. Um, without having to involve really a lot of other people. Yeah. <laughs> but there was like um, a $30, $35 for a t-shirt or yeah. something. And like we would well, get... Well, and I know like merch is expensive sometimes, but we don't... Necess- I don't know the quality of that t-shirt yeah. or if they have to pay shipping. or yeah. I don't know anything about yeah. this besides that that would be like the cost and what we would get out of it. And for me, I was like, Ugh. I would rather put my all into it if I'm going to commit to it rather than half-ass it just to get it going. Yeah, and we realized that, like, how we were communicating about it was probably misleading. Yeah. So, like, the hope is eventually. Yes. Are we actively in progress? No. (laughs) Not necessarily. We're we're literally in the very, very, very beginning stage where we're just trying to figure out how the fuck to even start yeah, that? What does that world look like? Yes. And the only reason we're bringing this up is because we love you guys mm-hmm. so fucking much and we appreciate you. And, and the fact that you support and value us enough to want to represent us in some type of way, whether that be on a T-shirt or a sticker or a badge or a mug, that means so much to us. And as two people who are such givers, like... We are like, oh my God, let me, let me do that for you. Absolutely. Please, I want you to have this. And that's why I wanted to. That's why I was like, I'm going to commit right before my summer classes. This is going to be my full time job for now. And then life things happened and it was overwhelming. Right. And Jerry was talking to me about it today and was like, I think maybe the less stress that you put on yourself right now, the better. Well, that's part of the problem is like. I've talked before about how I feel like because I can't give 100% of myself to my photography business, I feel like a shit business Mm -hmm. owner. And because I can't give 100% of myself to my children, I feel like a shit mom. I feel like there aren't, there's not enough of me. Yeah. And that I keep splintering pieces of myself to fill all of these roles. And I feel like I'm just spreading myself so thin that I'm drowning. And um, so I had a wedding in Pittsburgh, which I told you guys about. And then Shane and I left for our vacation that Sunday. We have not been on a vacation in years. Since you had the the baby, yes, right? Yeah. yeah. And I have not gone that long without working either. Uh-huh. So I have not taken that much time off of work. Even when I went to the beach with Shane's whole family, I worked on a wedding the whole time I was there. Yep. So like... I have not stopped working in two years. Mm-hmm. And so to take four days off was really scary yeah and then I took four days off it was also the first time I was going to be away from forest right it was going to be the first time after COVID that somebody was going to be 
staying overnight and watching them Mm -hmm. like uh, that was hugely stressful for me and I don't I like to think that I am a a semi carefree person when it comes to that like I trust people with my kids whatever but like I was terrified terrified it's it's anxious just not knowing yeah and like Forrest isn't always sleeping through the night and like he's so active he's almost fallen down the steps he has um, like Ollie, while I was feeding for us one time, escaped through the front door. And I've made those like funny stories now because they're safe. But like, that's the stuff that replays in my head yeah. when I'm not here. And you know that that is possible, that that yes. can happen. If someone is there and doesn't know that that can happen yes. and it happens as quickly as it does, because you have very fast children. I know. <laughs> so like, that's, I, I can totally right. understand that being. So I knew I was anxious and then I had committed, I had a couple who had postponed their wedding and then asked me, hey, we're actually still going to sign the papers. Can you fly to New Hampshire to do this? And I said, yes, I found a way to do it affordably for them. And so I was going to literally get home from vacation, have a day and then fly to New Hampshire Mm -hmm. only for 24 hours. And then I had to be home for an engagement session. So like there was so much going on and it was the first time I was going to be flying post COVID. I don't and, like flying in general. Well, then I found out that I thought that I was flying into New Hampshire, and really I was flying into Massachusetts. Oh, no. So I had to drive much farther than I thought I did after a long ass plane ride. After and like not a lot of sleep. Yeah, getting up at three a.m. to go, and like this is all my fault. It's mm-hmm. my fault because I'm spreading myself so thin, and things are like falling through the cracks. Obviously, the couple had no idea everything went Went off without a hitch but like for me i was struggling right not to mention ollie's never been sick he had he had covid with me i'm pretty sure yeah but it was just like a cough he's never had a fever and he's never thrown up Mm, and that's when they get to that point so it's so sad well because you don't know what to do for them well the night before i left for new hampshire ollie had a fever of 102 (gasps) And well, that's projectile vomited. Yeah. Like everywhere. Three different times. Went limp in my arms. Like was kind of disoriented. And I'm looking at Shane and I'm sobbing like, how am I supposed to get on a plane right now? Yep. How am I supposed to leave him? Yeah. How am I supposed to know that when he gets up in the morning, I'm not going to be here? Right. What does that say about me? And he's like, Jerry, you have a job to do. And I'm like, yeah. And what does that say about me that I'm leaving to go to a job? Picking that. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of staying here. And he was fine the next day. He literally, like, he was, the it, fever broke and he was totally okay. Those bugs usually last, like, 24 hours, but they're scary. Yes, well, it was my hours. first time experiencing it, too. Yeah. And, like, all I wanted him to know was that, like, I I'm love here. him. I am going to take care of him, mm-hmm. that he can rely on me, and I couldn't do that because I had to leave. Yeah. And so now, again, I'm picking between being there for my kid and being a good business person. Yep. Which because you I had feels a commitment. Like even though you're doing both, that it's you're not really given a hundred percent to either. Right, right. So I was just feeling so overwhelmed. I didn't sleep. Um, and then that's why I had my stress dream yesterday, because it was the first time that I had slept in over twenty four hours. Oh my god, um, I can't even so that was m- me feeling completely overwhelmed. Yeah. And then when I'm on my way home from New Hampshire, I get a message from Sierra. So, okay, here's the deal, guys. <laughs> I've talked about it a little bit um, on previous episodes, but again, if you haven't caught up, when I was pregnant with Noah, I went into labor early. At 27 weeks, I started bleeding fa- very badly yeah, and um, cramping really bad. I went in. They said, you're having contractions. You are dilating. Your cervix is already, like, it's not supposed to be dilating yet. It's not good. They were able to stop it um, with a bunch of medicine and give me steroid shots. But at that point, Noah was three pounds, maybe. That was on the ultrasound. They said, we think about three pounds. And they had a helicopter on the hospital because the hospital I was delivering at at that point didn't have a NICU. Right. So, like, they were ready to take me. They're like, there's a good chance you're having a baby tonight. What, three or four months early? Yep. It was horrifying. Luckily... They stopped it. I was able to go on bed rest. That was a nightmare again in itself um, up until 34 weeks. And then I was let off of that. Mm-hmm. And I he stayed in there for five freaking more weeks, <laughs> which I was like, really, bitch? <laughs> but then this time around, 
since I have a history of that, they've been keeping an eye on it. My mm-hmm. cervix is shortening quicker than it should be again, which mm-hmm. is stressful. Um, and an added little fun bonus is that I have a partial placenta previa, mm-hmm. which means that when he attached, um, she- normally. Sorry, I, I was doing this with my mom <laughs> earlier. Know. I was putting no, my yeah. pregnancy with Noah with this pregnancy. Yeah, when she attached, um, the she did it really far down, mm-hmm. so the placenta started growing there. And normally it'll move up right. as you get along, but sometimes they don't. One mm-hmm. out of ten don't. Yeah, um, and because I have this previa and the short cervix, they're saying that. Um, you know, don't have sex, don't lift anything more than five pounds, don't push or pull anything more than five pounds, really try to take it easy because if you go into preterm labor again, your placenta could come out of your cervix and you could hemorrhage yeah. and then both of you could die. Right. They said it in nicer words. <laughs> yeah. But there's not a whole lot of nice ways you can say that. Right. Because they didn't want me to freak out, but they also ne- needed me to know, like, this is kind of a serious situation mm-hmm. we're in. So I've known that. Well, the other night, what was it? Friday night? Yeah. Out of nowhere, I start bleeding. Mm-hmm. Pretty bad. Bright red. And that's not what you want to see when you're pregnant, right. especially like 18 weeks and long. Because at 24, 25 weeks, if a baby comes, it's pretty bad, but they can survive. Yeah. 18 weeks, no. Right. So we rush to the emergency room. Um, she is doing fine, but I am still bleeding, and it's been a whole... Just, I already have like PTSD from when that happened with Noah, which I think is why I told my mom that I said, I literally think this is triggering me into thinking I'm pregnant with him again Yeah, because I keep saying he now I've been saying she this whole time. And now all of a sudden, and I literally called her Noah the other day. I was like, (laughs) well, that's just a having multiple kids. problem." (laughs) I know. know. But when I was talking to my mom, I was like, yeah. And Noah's been really active. And she's like, like no, well, technically no is very active. He's got ADHD. <laughs> yeah. He never stops. <laughs> but yeah, so I I think it's like my mind mentally right now is just a mess because yeah. I'm scared that mm-hmm. things could go wrong for me and for her. Um and I'm also like reliving the past. I don't want to go on bed rest again. That was such a... I know for some people, they're like, oh, that's the other thing that I'm cautious of. I feel so bad because I know people... I was a person who was struggling to get pregnant. And I feel that confliction of like, you should be grateful right now. At least you're pregnant. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I can't because I am terrified. Yeah. When we had our miscarriage before we got pregnant with her... Um, I thought, okay, at least if I make it to 14 weeks, I'll feel fine again. Yeah. And then I did, and I was like, but now I don't know if she's in there. (laughs) My symptoms started lessening, so I was like, "Uh oh. I said, at least if she starts kicking, I'll feel fine. She kicks all the freaking time. I feel it constantly. And now this is happening, and I'm like, when am I going to get to the point where I can just enjoy this and not be so scared that I'm not going to get to keep her? Yeah. I hate it. And Uh, that's... Never. (laughs) I know. I know. Yeah. But that's that's the worst part is I, I want to enjoy pregnancy. I see all these people that talk about how enjoyable it is. And I feel selfish and like um, ungrateful, again, that I finally got to have it after trying for so long. And all of these people who are still trying haven't got to. And I'm right. sitting over here like, I am miserable. I hate this. Right. But I did say to Jerry, which you said that it was a good analogy i'm like i know because you told me which was so nice by the way thank you but you're like you're a miracle your kids are miracles it's hard for me to think that if i would get pregnant 200 300 years ago i wouldn't have kids they wouldn't have survived and most likely i wouldn't have survived yeah um you couldn't have outrun anything bigger than you yeah (laughs) so true (laughs) and so you telling me because of medical intervention that these are miracles that yeah. this whole pregnancy is a miracle and i feel like you should be grateful for a miracle but here's the thing all miracles aren't they're magical they're not sometimes miracles suck yeah <laughs> i told her i was like it's it's similar to if you would get into a horrible car accident like terrible and they're like there is no way that someone survived that and you do 
but you are broken beyond belief. But you're alive. Yeah. You are a miracle. You lived. But you have to put yourself back together. Right. Um, you have to go through grueling therapy, physical therapy, and your mental health is not good. Those people are miserable. Sometimes their life is altered yes. completely. I know people that have had to have limbs amputated and things, and mm-hmm. it's they're, they're like, I get it. I'm grateful that I survived. But it sucked. Yeah. I wish it didn't happen. And not that I'm saying I wish this didn't happen, but I wish that I could get a normal one because this miracle, even though it's a miracle, isn't what I thought it would be. And, and you're that's, experiencing grief. I am grieving the loss of what I thought this pregnancy was going to be. I thought this right. was my chance to get a do-over, to have a the experience that everyone tells me they have when they're pregnant. It's joyous and no one really talks about how bad pregnancy sucks. Right. They really don't. And you being an empathetic person and being in groups and support groups that you, you've been for um, infertility and for pregnancy loss yeah. are aware that like there are so many people who want to be pregnant. And These so people like people would give anything just to see that positive line. Right. And now you're like, great, I can't even <laughs> grieve a different pregnancy. Yes. Because I should just be happy that I have a pregnancy. I, I should just be grateful that she's in there and she's healthy. Right. And, I am, all, and I am. And I am. There's but, always going to be a, a alternative. Yes. To There's always going to be another side of the coin that yeah. people could present to you. And like... Oh, it could be worse. It could be worse. And it totally could. She could well, not just, be here. People have had said to me after a miscarriage, well, it's a good thing it happened early. I Is it? Oh. No. I wish it would have <laughs> never happened at yeah. all. Th- that didn't help me. Thank like, you. When they when I told people Jonah had Down syndrome and that's mm-hmm. why he didn't make it, they're like, "Well, imagine what his life would have been." And I was like, "Are you seriously telling me that right now?" Right, that is not helpful. Are you insane, yeah. person? <laughs> I fucking can't stand yeah. people that do that. So I think, I think it's important to say you're allowed to grieve yeah. this because it's not just the the dream pregnancy you're grieving. Yeah, you are grieving. Oh no! <laughs> Damn! <laughs> you guys who said that thing that like there's always a, an emotional like cry over anything person and then an emotionless person. You were I grieving. did a lot of gr- or I did a lot of crying this weekend. <laughs> Bill, so. You never let me see you cry, and it's so annoying. I don't let anybody. I'm like a dog when they go to die. <laughs> 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 but when I cry, I just I lock myself in a closet. <laughs> I don't want anybody to see. <laughs> one time. One time. She almost cried. And she was like, excuse me, I'd like to take a minute and cry. And she turned her back to me, (laughs) squatted, put her hands in her face for like 10 seconds. Sobbed a little. Uh, You made no sound. No. And then you stood back up and you went, okay. (laughs) And I was like, what the fuck was that? That was your sobbing? I don't know what's wrong with me. It's no, it's that's fine. definitely something I need to talk to somebody about. <laughs> it's kind of impressive. <laughs> it is. I've gotten very good at yeah, it. You may not be able to outrun big scary things, but you could <laughs> definitely bewilder them. I know. I can't. Unless I like I said, if I'm watching like a sad show and then it's all bets are fucking off. Well, I need to watch Grey's Anatomy with you, you because do, I've see never it. seen you cry. But what I was going to say <laughs> is I don't feel like you're grieving. You are grieving the loss of this dream pregnancy, but like it's a part of a life that kept you going when you didn't want to keep going. Yep. Exactly. You were in a very, very toxic situation, yeah. dangerous situation. And the thought of having a future mm-hmm. where someone loved you and that you were in a supportive relationship and that you had a family, not not even just with your past relationship. But, like, as a child, you yeah. didn't have the stability. Never. That you are now able to provide your daughter. Yes. And, like, it goes, it's deeper than just the pregnancy. It but is. But it is the pregnancy. And I feel a little bit of guilt and um, sadness for her because I feel like I'm failing her. Like, right. my body is not providing her a safe space. Right. And that's something that's so important to me. Yeah. You nailed it. That's exactly what it is. It's that I feel like I finally got my safe place and I wanted to give her a safe place. And now I feel like like I'm failing her yeah. because of yeah. that. And you're not. And I'm I told not. you yesterday, <laughs> for everything you could say your body's doing wrong, it's doing so many other things right. That's so true. And I'm getting the shit kicked out of me. Yeah. Guys. yeah. I am now on progesterone shots weekly. I have to get stabbed in my ass. Yeah. <laughs> and it fucking hurts. Oh, my God. 
the she's like this medicine is thick so you mm-hmm. might have to like rub it with a washcloth she's con- real thick and juicy <laughs> it was and she was like turn around and bend over and i was like i know where this is going <laughs> just put it in there yeah. but it, it progesterone for those of you who've never been pregnant or don't even even those ones that do know this yeah. is something i didn't know in my beginning one See, I had progesterone, but I didn't have it in a shot form. Had I had it, it in a pill, pill form in my in my hoo ha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I highly suggest. They thought that th- that was what I was gonna have yeah. to have, but no, I have to yeah. get it into my bloodstream directly yeah. into there. So that hormone um, is what you start releasing like immediately when you get pregnant. That is what makes you have morning sickness. That is what makes you super bloated because yeah. um, it slows down your digestive system so that your baby can literally get all of those nutrients like. It's really trying to get everything from the food you eat. It makes you constipated Mm -hmm. because of that reason. So all of the moody as hell. So all these things I'm getting like an extra fucking dose of a week. Yeah. And it is, I spent all day today puking to you guys. It was, I was Marco Polo and Jerry. And at one point I like turned it on and I'm crying and I'm like, what's up? Just fucking threw my guts (laughs) up. No big deal. Anyway, how are you? It's amazing, though, because I always feel so much better. It's terrible when it's happening, and then I'm done, and I'm like, oh, my God. You I won. Feel like a new- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I am weak. I'll tell you that, but I feel great. And she literally was like, just vomited everything out of me. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a pizza. <laughs> I'm like, ew. Fucking, that sounds gross, but okay. I had to. Yeah. She, girls got to eat. Girl and a girl's got to eat. Yeah. We were hungry. Yeah. She was okay with the pizza for a while, but then I tried to eat something else and she threw that up. So she was like, mm, no. I love that she's like very specific. Pizza and tacos. Yeah. This Carbs. <laughs> she really. I love her. I'm trying so hard to. I'm like, I bought you fruits. I bought you vegetables. I'm no, trying to bitch. put the good. No. Uh-uh. She's like, I don't want that. What do I look like? Give me pasta. Give me pizza. Give me tacos. Yes. <laughs> or give me cake. Oh, I was like, don't say that. I know. I, I heard myself and then I. Cake. Let cake them eat is cake. better. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, it does make me feel a little bad that we're talking about this, and then now we're going to talk about someone who was murdered. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well. But. Is there a happy way to transition into murder? No. Maildale. Maildale. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> Probably not. But that's the other thing that I want to say is that uh, even though we're going to talk about something that's so terrible... That doesn't minimize what we're going through. Yeah. You're allowed to... It can be the smallest fucking thing. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm reading a book. Okay? I... That's exciting. I'm reading a book. I, Jerry, for you listeners who can't tell that it's me, (laughs) I, Jerry, am reading a book. And it's called What Happened to You. I'd love to talk to you guys about it. Well, let's read it If you're interested. Yeah. I'll read it and I'll tell you about it. Okay, because I never get that experience. I'm excited for that. So... Um, you would like to read it though. I'll tell you, it's Oprah Winfrey and Doctor Bruce Perry. I think. Oh, I I probably did not say that correctly. All I know is he's the black text and she's the blue text. Got it. <laughs> and it's kind of like an interview, but also storytelling. Hmm. It's really cool, but it talks about. Sorry, one more time. What is it called? What happened to you? Okay. Oh, and that's sad. Well, he, they're trying to change the conversation from "What's wrong with you?" to "What happened to you." Oh. Yeah. She's kicked when you said that. And I'm like, what happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you guys like that joke? But, um, anyway, <laughs> why did I bring that up? What were you talking about before? Oh, uh, tra- maybe trauma? No, murder? Uh, murder. Oh, no, no, no. You were talking about, <laughs> yeah. you were talking about how, um, it could, we're talking about two different things, but we're allowed to feel yeah, sad, yeah, 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 even yeah. though this is even also bad. Bad is bad, regardless. Yeah, yeah. But in this book, he was talking about how, like, trauma is different for everyone. Mm-hmm. So, like, an event for one person could be a resilience building activity. Yes. For another person, it, it could be them. traumatic. Yes. And another person, it's just like nothing. Yes. So, like, one person could be strengthened, all the same event. Yes. The example that was given in the book is a fire in a elementary school yeah so the fire happens in the classroom of like the first grader so the little girl who's witnessing this fire is now terrified for sure traumatic event she now has ptsd from the situation firefighter comes in and is like i got this no problem so traumatic event for the firefighter is actually a resilience building activity yes okay now the fifth grader 
in a different room heard about the fire mm-hmm. and he was like did you hear about that fucking fire that was that dope was crazy. but because he didn't experience it firsthand yes it he didn't, didn't have the shit. same result as it did to the first grader who saw it happen or the firefighter or the who- firefighter so that's why he was also saying like the the pandemic yes could have been severely traumatic for some people and nothing to others i just had an argument with somebody over facebook because i love to do that. <laughs> you i know i know it's gotten worse since yeah. i've been on these shots <laughs> yeah because again i'm moody and a little mouthy yeah um but he was basically i was actually very nice to this person because what he was saying was basically about drug addicts and i don't understand how someone could even try it for the first mm-hmm. time Blah blah blah. It, blah. The book goes into that, and we were explaining. There was me and two other girls who were both like the one girl works with um, drug and alcohol addiction, and mm-hmm. the other one just I think has addicts in her family. And they were all like, "It's these people's." Um, the reason why you don't know is because you've ne- you probably don't have the trauma that they have that right. has forced them to want to numb it their right. lives. Basically, nobody wants to try heroin for the first time. Like. This is going to be fun. We all fucking know it's been beaten into our heads what that drug does to us. Do you think the people who are doing it are just like, this will be a fun time for me? Well, he talks about in the book how um, you have, you need to get, like, regulation is rhythmic. And regulation, regulating your entire system is what keeps you at a a stable state. Homeostasis. And yes. And when you go through a prolonged period of not being stable yeah or not having not having access to rhythmic regulation you seek it out yourself yes to get yourself back yep into that so like if you don't have someone soothing you you will soothe yourself in ways that potentially are harmful yes so so i explained it to him i'm like maybe heroin you can't even fathom and i get it because you've never had the urge to but alcohol is a drug that we do that to food is a drug that we do that to sex is a drug that we do that with um those are all examples that he used how to fill your reward bucket yes So we do all of the, and I was explaining to him, um, and he said, well, I know people who have gone through terrible trauma and they've never done that. And I said, trauma is subjective. What was traumatic to you or what you think is traumatic for these people to go through? And you look at somebody and you said, their life is not traumatic. You have no idea Mm -hmm. what happened to them that could have made, and even if you knew, you might not think it's that big of a deal because it didn't happen to you. Right. You don't have the same response. Right. That is something that is completely subjective to the person that it happens to. Right. We can't choose what is traumatic to right. us. And we, it biologically changes your brain. That's exactly what it is. It's not something you you cannot, ha- you, it has an effect on you that you can't just be like, oh, well, right. I just saw a fire. Yeah. Um, I know it wasn't a big deal. Nobody died in it. So I'm fine now. You don't have the choice. Right. You literally yeah. can't help it. And I can explain that to you in another episode because there's parts of the brain that make that so. Mm. And it was explained to me in a way that I had like an aha moment. I love that. Anyway. Okay. okay. So we're you're like 40 minutes in and have not even <laughs> talked about this case. That's okay. It's, so. it's pretty quick. Okay, cool. So um, after... Quite the intro. Sorry, everybody. You came for the true crime and you got some mental health shit. So (laughs) you came for the true crime. We gave you the tangents. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Tangents and true crime. It was in order, at least. It really was. I'll put like a timestamp or something for people who really don't give a shit and want to just get to this part. About us at all. Yeah. But also, if you do, you should just like listen to a full on true crime. I, I forget what. Oh, I think it was the Feral People episode. I saw someone make a comment that was like actual information starts at this time and i was like thank you thank you for telling people because my fucking bad (laughs) just kidding Um, hold on i'm trying to find yep i found the article okay so this oh for those of you who don't know what this tangent oh my god sorry there's there's rum in here um what this tangents and true crime is about this is referencing a scandal that we got sent in yeah. that we shared on the bonus episode, the exclusive episode. Yes. So if you don't know, I won't spoil it for you. But um, this is the murder of Ruben Borkart. Hmm. Are you ready? Yeah. So this is from um, Murderpedia, <laughs> like okay. we talked about before. But it's a... I didn't know Murderpedia was a thing, guys. It's the best. Basically, they take all of these articles that talk about it and they yeah. just put it all in one place. Oh, so helpful. About the person. And then they give you stats on that person, like a fucking baseball card. 
<laughs> but it's like murder stats. What? <laughs> yeah, so this person, there's like classification, characteristics, number of victims, dates of murders, dates of arrest, date of birth. Yes. Victim Crazy. profile. Crazy. Okay, okay, okay. So here we go. Very thorough. I know. Um, it says at 3.35 a.m. last Easter Sunday. This is in 1994. So, so definitely Easter. not this last Easter Sunday. <laughs> no, this is from a people uh, thing right after them. Pr- Got it. People. Okay. So this is 95? Na- e- this it, article is from December 19th, 1994. So okay. it's talking about previously in April. Um, 17-year-old Chuck Borkart, asleep in a first-floor bedroom of his Jefferson, Wisconsin home, was awoken by a very loud bang. A few minutes later, he heard the sound of what he describes as a cow mooing. That's what he thought it sounded like. So he oh, approaches no, the, his dad. So he approaches the living room and hears noises coming from the basement. I feel so bad that I think that that's funny. I, not 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 that his dad was dying, mooing? but that he described his dad dying as a cow mooing. Okay, hold on. I have a tangent about this. One <laughs> time, I'll tell you. So one time, um, my mom was super fucking drunk. Uh-huh. And I knew that she was going out to get drunk. It was like rally in the alley, which is like a thing where everyone goes and drinks yeah. before like a big football game. Yeah. We live in a, in a very small town. Yeah. It's exciting for people. Rivalries. So I knew she was going to get fucking smashed, right? Yeah. So I hear her come home. I'm in like, I think me and Taylor are you about are to call still your in... mom a cow? No. <laughs> okay. I think me and Taylor are still in high school. And we have bedrooms that are right beside each other. And then my mom's bedroom is across the hall. Uh-huh. Well, I hear... Some banging around, and then I hear the loudest moaning I've ever heard in my life. It's like, oh, oh. <laughs> right? So Taylor opens her door, uh-huh. and she goes, Mom? And I <laughs> opened mine, and I go, get the fuck back in your bedroom. Because <laughs> I'm like, if they're fucking, <laughs> yeah. I for sure don't want to hear this. I'm going to go to bed, and ha- this is a traumatic moment for me. Yeah. Turns out the next morning, I made my sister go to bed and not check on my mom. My mom had slipped on the dance floor and ripped her hamstring. Oh, my God. <laughs> she was in the most pain. And she was just on the floor in the basement. <laughs> How did she like, get in the basement? Well, d- her husband was there, and I think he carried her. So they ended he up. He carried her to the basement? I don't know if they were. Maybe they weren't in the basement. Maybe they were in the kitchen. Is that how she broke her hips? I don't know. Well, and no, people, yeah. multiple people told me later that they saw her <laughs> eat ass because <laughs> she was trying to dance and did. Did a... you say eat ass again? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Multiple people watched my mom eat ass <laughs> <laughs> on the dance floor. On the dance floor, and she had really like high boots on, and she slipped and did a yeah. not a split on purpose, yeah. a split on accidentupsies. Yes. <laughs> So, ripped her hamstring. That's a very bad injury, by the way, if yeah. you don't know. Um, it was the worst thing I've ever seen. Her bruise, and it was just disgusting. Yeah. We had to sponge bathe her for like weeks after that. By we, I mean my sister, because I was not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why she likes my sister more now. <laughs> we Love all know. It. But anyways, that was, I can understand. Like, I didn't know it was moaning for help. I was like, she's... <laughs> Getting it. Yeah. And I we need to go back to our room. Yeah, we need to give her some privacy. Yeah. When really she's like, I need a I ride to the hospital. Honestly need to go get help. And I get her husband couldn't take her because he was wasted. Yeah. I'm assuming too. Yeah. I don't know how they go. <laughs> That's well, not definitely not walking. No. Okay. Back to the fucking horror. Yeah. Um so when he leaves his room, all of the family, the Borkarts, are experienced hunters. They live on like a huge acre of land that's like on a national reserve and they go hunting and it's like a very peaceful thing. So as soon as he gets out of his bedroom, he smells gunpowder and he walks downstairs um, t- down to the cellar stairs where his dad had been like living in the basement. Kind yeah. of. I'll explain that later. Um, he sees Reuben and he's bleeding and slumped across the chair he was shot in the chest in the back. Um, Ruben is 40 years old, and he was still conscious at this point. Oh, wow. So he's like, go get the phone, call 911. When Chuck went up, the phone was off the hook, <gasps> like unhooked. So he plugs it back in because it's the 90s, and that's all you had to fucking do. But yeah, then he had to no wait a little phones. bit. Yeah. And um, he called 911. He holds his father's hands. When I listened to the 911 call because I also watched an episode of Snapped oh. and an episode on um, IE, Investigation Discovery, on this. 
Did I ever tell you about what my mom said to me when she was watching Snapped one time? No. She would just sit and watch Snapped and fold laundry, oh. like just with a just with no emotion at all. Mm-hmm. And I looked at her and I was like, "Why do you watch Snapped all the time? Like just binge it." <laughs> And without even breaking eye contact with the laundry basket, she goes, I'm learning from their mistakes. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I think I got to call someone. <laughs> See, saying things like that, she probably shouldn't. Because somebody in here said things like that, that really came by, back to bite him in the ass. Uh-oh. And I just told everyone, Mom, <laughs> please you can't don't. do anything now. You truly can <laughs> everyone knows. Uh, okay, so he's... So when I listen to the 911 call, it sounds... Sorry, I feel like I have to tell everyone my mom's a big kidder. <laughs> yeah, she is, she's a joker. <laughs> she's just a jokey jokester. No worries. No, I don't no think danger they, here. Do you think that they know, by the way, that we are, like, obviously... <laughs> oh, <laughs> I feel yeah. like they know. Where that comes from? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, like, there are certain 911 calls that I hear, and I'm like, wow, this person sounds like... They're not, they don't give a fuck. And that was this guy. But at the same time, I think he was like in total shock. Yeah. His dad was bleeding profusely. Yeah. Like the, at one point, the lady's like, I'm trying to make sure he doesn't go into shock. And he's like, Yeah, you, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's in shock already. <laughs> That's how he says it. But you can hear the dad moaning and saying stuff. And he's saying, he's giving descriptions. There was two men that came in and shot him, he says. Uh huh. And then at the end, right before he died, he murmurs, I can't believe she would do this to me. <gasps> I got yes. chills. I Ew. Know. So when asked, the police take Chuck and they interview him because he's the only person in the house. Yeah. It doesn't look like a burglary. Nothing was taken. Can you imagine hearing a, hearing a cow moo and then getting up and then finding your dad shot? No. And you don't know, like... Is anyone else still in the house? Oh, this is important, too. Um, This was the first homicide in over 20 years in this town. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Dang. I just imagined the town with, like, that that sign where it's, like, it's been so long <laughs> since our last. And they have and to go like, back yeah. to zero. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it Started reminds over. me of a place, like, when we lived where we live now, we would never lock our doors at night, yeah. ever, growing up. Yep. Now I lock my doors even when I'm at home because yeah. I'm like, I don't trust motherfuckers. Uh-huh. <laughs> but it's it, my sister, she's, we all have the freaking alarms that you could see people, those yeah. ring alarms. I don't trust people. <laughs> um, so when they're asking Chuck, they're like, who do you think that he meant by that? And he said, I, I believe it was his wife, Diane. So, so is that not his mom? That is, okay. So Diane, um, originally at... She was born Diane Pfister. Um, she, let's see, this is farther down, but I'm trying to do it by memory. Okay. Let's just see if we can fucking do it. Okay. So, Ruben, um, Diane was the kind of person who, when she was born, she grew up, she wanted to be in the military. She was somebody who said she never wanted to stay in one place for too long. She was always trying to, like, move around. Yeah, nomadic. So, yeah. And her dad was like, you're not joining the fucking military, which, I mean, I get it kind of to a point. You want to protect your child. But so she's like, well, then fine. I'm going to marry this guy, Yeah, which is not Ruben. It was another man. Got it. And he was super, uh, like, way older than her, but he took her places. So she married him. Got it. And it did not work out. So she's going to take it out of here. (laughs) Yes. But then she just left him. She was like, fuck this. I don't want. I think it got to the point where. Was my country accent? needed wisconsin <laughs> what do you sound like in wisconsin? i don't know do they have honestly cheap? chuck in the interview chuck sounded canadian really yeah. oh yeah um yeah 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 they had they a little have, bit like, of that cheese there <laughs> yes that's yeah. what it sounded like okay so. i just always default to country for some reason i know we went to hawking hills which is in ohio <laughs> which is like Two hours from here, mm-hmm. and they had country accents. I'm like, where, where am I? Where the fuck am I at? Yeah, I don't know. So everyone just has a country accent to me. Yeah. So on the flip side <coughs> Sorry. of Diane, mm-hmm. um, Chuck was born and raised in this town, mm-hmm. never left. He ended up marrying his first high school sweetheart. Her name was Susan. They had two children together, Chuck and Brooke, I believe is the daughter's name. Okay. And then I believe they were... Oh, maybe four and five. They were very young. I don't think it says in this article. It said it um, on what I watched. But Susan ended up dying in a car accident. Oh, tragic. And it was like Chuck's love of his life. Yeah. So at that time, 
this is so fucking weird. But he was working at a lumber mill. And Diane was, she had settled in this town after she left her other husband because it wasn't working out. He wanted to have kids. And she was like, I'm not fucking doing that. So, because she was still really young. She moves to this town. She gets a job as a secretary in this, like, factory lumber mill. She meets Chuck. They're just friends. They work together. Whatever. No big deal. She finds out he uh, stopped working for a month when his wife died. And when he comes back, she learns that it was, you know, his wife had passed away. He's got these two young kids. And she literally says, I didn't feel love. It wasn't passion. I just knew his kids needed a female role model in their life. So You I, didn't want to be a female role model for any other kids. <laughs> right. But she's like, I just felt such sympathy when I saw him with these kids. And I was like, we should get married. Basically what? is how she she says it in the thing. Yeah. Like there was no passion or romance between them. It was just kind of like, I know your wife just died. You want to fucking do this shit? Yeah. So they do. Within a year, they get married. Hot. What a courtship. I know. And I think that she kind of took advantage of Chuck because Brooke. Well, it sounds like it. Very much so. Brooke, her, his daughter, says later on in the interview, she's like, um, he would joke, but we all knew it wasn't a joke, that he was like, I knew the marriage was crap from uh, the t- because when I walked out, the church door hit me on the ass on the way out or something like that. Yeah. So he knew like it wasn't going to work. He would say that to people. So Chuck and Brooke both say that she's, Diane is uh, fine. They're like, she was nice if you were on her good side, but she gave you hell if you got on her bad side. Right. But then she gets pregnant with um, Ruben, Mm. and they have a daughter named Regan. Even though she didn't want children. Right. And when that happens, the two stepkids uh, say that she becomes verbally abusive and physically abusive to them. Wow. So it it just, that kind of shakes up the house a little bit. Um, they say that their parents fight constantly. Brooke used to, like, beg them to get a divorce. Yeah. Which, you know, if you're, if you're at that point with your kids, number one, they can tell that you're not in love and you're fighting yeah. way too much in front of them. Yeah. Um, and there was just, she was just like, we just wanted to go back to being happy. And we wanted our dad to be happy. Right. Could you, that trauma of like losing your mom and not only losing your mom, but like losing the safety of your family unit. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And their house was huge. Ruben built the house himself. Wow. It was on this like nature observatory. And so he didn't want to leave, even though I guess she got hit and she died right out in front of their house. Like it was right. So like awful. But again, this is the home. So they're living in the home that, Susan lived in. They say that Diane was super jealous of Susan. She would get mad when Chuck or the, or I'm sorry, Reuben or the kids would talk about yeah Susan, which it's like, what the fuck do you expect? Like that was there. That's a fucking red flag. I'm gonna say that right now. Yeah. If you're with anybody who has lost a spouse, or you know anybody who's like with, newly with somebody whose spouse has they're widowed, and they're like jealous when you talk about the person that you lost. That is the biggest red flag yeah. to me. Why, how are you jealous of a dead person? And you, you expect them to just forget them because you're in their life now? Like, they're not yeah. allowed to love them anymore? Right. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So. Although I have told Shane, like, I will haunt. No, absolutely. I told Corey if he moves on without me. That I'm <laughs> going to be there watching. <laughs> I will haunt you. Yeah. No, for sure. So I hope she's <laughs> fine with it. Yeah. I hope she likes me being around. Oh, so I'm allowed to hate her. She right, just can't she hate can't me. hate you. You're dead. That's fucked up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I hate her. Yes, okay. that's fine. <laughs> okay, I you know I don't see anything I, wrong I with can't. that. So many people are like, no, I want him to move on. I want someone to like. No, I don't. Place. <laughs> I want them. Well, we, we don't certainly want this shit to happen. No, no. So okay. Oh, well, I need to change my tune, don't I? That's what we just learned. Oh uh, well, <laughs> we're all about growth here. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so she is a, they, the town calls her Mrs. B. She has like a little print t-shirt shop that she has. And she's also a study hall monitor slash teacher's aide at the Jefferson High School. Okay. Um, the reason we know about this is because a student at the high school sent us this story. Yeah, and if you want at the end, I have the thing so I can read it. Okay, so I did, I'm realizing now that I got the, they have the children's age. Um, Chuck was only a year old when his mom died, and Brooke was three. Mm. 
And then they got married eight months after she died. Oh, damn. I know. Real quick. Real quick. Again, I think Definitely she kind of... Definitely not enough time to grieve. Well, yeah. I think and she manipulated that situation yeah. big time. And he's got this nice house. I don't know, man. Yeah. Mm. Um, so then eight months after that, sh- they had their daughter, Regan. Wait oh. a minute. <laughs> now I'm seeing maybe why Timeline they got Timeline <laughs> is a little <laughs> okay. suspect. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> it's funny that we said it's gross to speculate that people get <laughs> married because they're pregnant. And now, and we're, now like, we're like, oh, oh scandal scandal. <laughs> I think maybe. <laughs> yeah. But... No, it's fine. We just get it. I get now why. Well, the timeline is suspect, especially because it ended the way that it did. Right. Well, now later on, they find out um, they're fighting all the time. They literally don't like each other. Like the whole time, it's like it seems like everybody knew how unhappy they were. Yeah. I don't even know if there was really any love. Um, well, then Ruben meets somebody and does fall in love and he begins to have an affair. Ooh. And people find out about it, so he decides to tell Diane. Okay. But the way he tells her is, I'm having an affair. I love this woman. We are getting married. She's moving in here. Oh, yikes. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So, so, and Diane says the first thing she did is hit him in the mouth. She's like, that's the first time I ever got physical with him. I popped him right in the mouth. Bad form. Yeah. Bad form. Yep. Um, so that was a tricky business, but at the same time, I get it. If you've never been in love and then you finally, or you have, but yeah. it's been so long and then you're with this woman and all you do is fight and then you find someone that you love again. Right. It's hard to not and be And how excited. are you going to leave a home that you built? That's it. So they yeah. begin this terrible custody battle. First yeah. of all, she's trying to get custody of his kids. I don't think she ever adopted them. So I'm like. How do you Who do, do that? You fucking think you are. Yeah. yeah. And she's trying to get the house, which again, he built, he had with his first wife, like right. back the fuck off. While this is going on though, he's like, fuck it, I'll live in the basement. Yeah. So he starts living in the basement. They're still living together. They fight even more now because he's like seeing another woman. Right. Was she coming to the house? She was living there. Oh, the woman? Oh, yeah. I don't know. It didn't say. I was gonna say he had them both living there? <laughs> no, I don't think she was like risky staying with business. Him. But it was, yeah. So um, Diane is a a student, what did I say? A study hall monitor. Study hall monitor, yes. So she has these children. If I were falling asleep, would I remember that? (laughs) That's what I'm saying. I'm proud of you. She's got these. Hold on. I got to get my spot again. Um, Sorry. I'll I'll say that part in a minute. But this says, Reuben, according to his friends, was quite different than Diane. They say he'd walk into a room and he'd light it up with his smile. Um, He was very social and Diane was very antisocial and very anti-Susan. She did everything she could to obliterate the memory of Susan, even getting upset when people would say that her... Susan's daughter looked like her, Brooke. What? Yeah. What? You want her to all of a sudden look Look like like you? you? Like, (laughs) that's not how genetics work, bitch. Yeah. Um... At times, in fact, she seemed abnormally possessive of Reuben, who ran a successful cabinet-making business from their home outside of town. For as long as she could, Diane tried to hide from Brooke and Chuck the fact that Susan was their natural mother. Whoa. Oh, yeah, because they were so young. One and three, yeah. She was jealous. She wanted us to think she was our real mom, says Brooke. This is giving me very much vibes of uh, just as she wanted in those kids' life. Not even so much about him, which is yucky. Weird. Yes. Um, she would get furious when she heard that I looked like Susan. For years, Brooke and Chuck say, Reuben tried to avoid fights, and for the sake of domestic tranquility, he urged his children to just respect Diane. Um, then he starts seeing this woman. And then in January of 1994, he files for divorce, and that's when he moves into the basement. Um, she refuses to leave the home. And or sign the papers, I'm assuming. Yes. And at this point, Chuck is 16 and Brooke is gone to college. Damn, she's in their life for a long Long. freaking time before this happens. She was in his life for 15 years. Yeah. Yeesh. And with how bad it sounds like, that is a long time to endure all that. 
It said she became increasingly angry. Every testimony I heard on this thing was that she was just an angry, bitter woman. And I'll tell you, when she, they did an interview with her mm-hmm. on the um, investigation discovery thing. Yeah. She is a fucking Karen. <laughs> yeah. She looks like the type of person, if she walked in and sat at my table, I'd be like, uh-uh. I'm <laughs> fucking taking her. She just looks bitchy and pissy. Yeah. And she also just... Like she would... Um have her husband murdered yeah she seems very narcissistic very narcissistic uh she anytime she talks about this thing it's never like poor root it's always poor me yeah i'm so sad that this happened to me like what the things she says in this documentary make me be like uh, make me be like (laughs) me be like (laughs) me be like i don't know about this one (laughs) yeah no i did i just she made me I feel like I'm a good judge of character. Yeah. And she gave me like icky, icky, icky vibes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Brooke goes to college. But Chuck stays and said, mostly I stayed at a friend's house because I didn't want to be there. More than once, says Brooke, Diane threatened her father. Reuben took the threat so seriously that he would routinely line up empty mayonnaise jars in a hallway leading to the cellar door. It was a makeshift alarm because he said that he was afraid that she would do something to him in, in his sleep. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Um, so then her anger seemed to increase after Reuben won physical custody of Chuck in a court order and she was told to vacate the house because they get into this, the very last fight after she realizes she lost this battle yeah. of custody and it becomes physical. She hit him, I think in the face again and he grabbed her arms. And when he did that, she went to the police and was like, he's abusing me. Uh huh. And the police were like, well, then you just need to get out of the house. Yeah. Because right now it's still his house. And if it's dangerous for you to be there, you need to just leave. Right. So she's pissed that she has to leave. So it says at Jefferson High, students begin to notice a change in Diane. While always capable of either being real nice or a bitch. <laughs> that's <laughs> in quotes. Yeah. That one student said she now seemed very depressed. You could tell she was stressed out last year. Says one of her students, um, she'd be crying in class and everyone knew about the divorce. So she'd go in there and talk to these 14 and 15 year old kids constantly about what was going on. My husband beats me. He's cheating on me. Yeah. He's taking my kids in the house. Sob stories. She'd cry right. to them. Like, fucking, what are you doing? Honestly, that's so weird. Y- so there was weird. someone I worked with at one point in time who would speak about things in front of kids that I was like, are we, is everyone cool with this? Because <laughs> like, I, I feel, feel like this is not allowed. No. I worked with a guy who dictated everything she said, had like pages, thir- I think it was like 25 pages <gasps> at the end of the year of just like dictating all of the stuff that he was like, this is not okay. And he presented it to like the principal. Good, good. Cause not it's shit not okay. happened. Oh, not of shit course happened. not. Terrible district. Jesus Christ. But yeah. Well, that's... The writing was impeccable. (laughs) Um, Okay, so then she starts to put this plan into motion, it says. She gets three of her students. In a statement given to police, Doug Vest, who was the first person, actually the second person, she went to a boy named Tim and was like, hey... My, I need to get rid of my husband or something like that. I need him to go away. The fact that she's asking students this. Well, uh, technically, they say she didn't ask. She was just like, I really need him to go away. You know what I mean? Yeah. Kind of thing. And he was like, yeah. She's like, do you think you could help me? So much so that she draws a picture of her the inside of her house as to like where you can what? find him uh, to this Tim kid. Uh-huh. And Tim keeps this, <gasps> then uses it against Tim. her in court. Fucking hero. We love Tim. Well, Tim's cousin, Doug. Fucking Doug. I know. We've all got a cousin, Doug, don't we? we? Don't we all? (laughs) (laughs) Old cousin, Doug. Um, He gives police a statement saying that she contacted him three, four, or five times, claiming she needed his help to get rid of her husband. She said Reuben was physically abusive to her, and then in whispered conversations in study hall, she said she would lose everything in the divorce. She picked on vulnerable children, says one Jefferson student's mother. Every one of them had a single parent or some problem in their life. She also promised them money. Oh. They were going to get $20,000. Holy hell. Can you imagine? First of all, this is in the 90s. Yeah. But can you imagine back in the... I thought... I remember when I graduated high school and I got my graduation money, yeah. which was like three grand or yeah. something. I was like, I am fucking... <laughs> so sorry. What the fuck just came out of my mouth? <laughs> <laughs> 
Are you a lizard person? <laughs> I don't know what's living inside of me, but it's trying to get a lizard. Out. Okay. What if I just peel my? I'm like, by the way, guys, <laughs> Q on is real, and I'm a fucking lizard person. <laughs> just got scary because your eyes got really glossy and I was like, is this happening? No, I think I was dissociating because I got okay. embarrassed by the throat thing. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Sorry. Fair enough. Oh, three grand was a lot of fucking money. I was yes. like, I'm rich, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> and so 20 grand to, well, especially a, to a 15, kid. 16 year old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who comes from a broken home. Yes. Not to mention 20 Oh, 20 I don't want to say broken home. I don't want to say broken home for a kid who comes from a single parent home because i don't i that's a negative way to put that so i'm gonna change my stance on that okay okay sorry go ahead no it's okay i like that you did that because i'm from a broken home <laughs> <laughs> but we don't like to say that yeah um plus she was gonna give her wedding and engagement rings and two cars she's gonna give all of these to the kids this is a lottery i know well yeah <laughs> this is the Do price is kids? right apparently Everybody said that um, Doug was a nice guy by fellow students. Oh, this is from one of his friends, Jose. He said, I can't explain how he got involved. The money must have looked good to a 16-year-old. According to his police statement, Vest's police statement, Diane gave him around $600 as a down payment, and he recruited his friend, Josh Yankee, Uh um, who they describe as as very shy a chicken. This is the other kid. He stutters a lot when he's scared. Oh, fuck you. Yeah. That's not, that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I'm going to fight this fucking 16 year old. Yeah, I don't think he's 16 anymore. Well, maybe he is. <laughs> <laughs> he stayed 16. It's like that fucking, he's Benjamin Button. <laughs> um, he's now six months old. <laughs> <laughs> there was also somewhere that said that uh, he was voted the sweetest boy at the high school. Douglas Vest is 17. Um, his friend Joshua Yankee is 16. He's a member of the school choir. And then they get Douglas, Doug Vest's cousin, Michael Maldonado. Mm-hmm. He's 15 and okay. he's a high school dropout. And they're like, you want to help? You want in on this? Let's freaking do it. Um, so they make this plan. They're going to go in. They know she tells them how to get into the house. She tells them where he'll be. They walk in. Well, actually, they drive up there, and Yankee, the one kid, was like, I can't fucking do this. We shouldn't be doing this. I'm going to stay in the car. I don't want to do this. And then Doug Vest was like, fucking same. I am getting cold feet. Michael Maldonado is like, "Let's." we said we were going to do it. Let's fucking do this. So he grabs the gun. They have a sawed-off 410 shotgun. You could have literally said anything there, and I'd have been like, I have no idea what the fuck (laughs) that is. For sure. Yeah. (laughs) Sounds about right. Yeah. Um. So they go into the house, and I think it's just Doug and Michael. Yankee stayed in the car. He was yeah. like, I'm fucking not doing it. No, I lied. He went in. He unplugged the phone. Then he went back to the car. Got it. The other two went down. They they meet um, Ruben on the steps because he's coming up like, who the fuck? Yeah. And they shoot him while he's on the steps. He falls backwards. They shoot him again, um, and then he stumbles into a chair, and that's where he's eventually found. Yeah. So... After Ruben's death, Diane's ap- behavior appears peculiar to Chuck and Brooke. Um, their attorney was struck by how bitterly she complained to him when Susan was mentioned in Ruben's obituary. People say her motive was greed, but I think it was obsession. If she couldn't have him, then nobody else could, is Ew, what somebody yeah. said. She was pissed that they put his dead wife in his obituary with him. Like, yeah. who the fuck do you think? Again, also, making it you, about you. Yeah. Your wh- ex estranged husband, whatever, just died. Yeah. And everybody said she was super weird. She wouldn't talk to the cops. She wouldn't, she didn't want to do, have anything to do with any of it. She's yeah. like, no, it couldn't be me. I don't know. Well, bitch, it could be because yeah. they find out. Um, I believe it's Michael Maldonado. First of all, here's why you don't trust teenagers to do your fucking shit. They talk to everybody. Yeah. So he starts bragging about it, and people find out, and they go to the cops. And yeah. so I believe Yankee, Josh Yankee, is the one who finally confesses for everybody because, again, he's the one that was like, I didn't want to yeah. fucking do this in the first place. And so they That's kind the of. chicken? Yes. Got it. So they kind of give him a plea deal. They're like, mm-hmm. if you tell us what happened with these other two, then we'll make sure that you get less time. Because you're looking at time, buddy. We know that you were For all there. For sure. Yeah. And now you're in big trouble. Um, when she rates the trial. Oh, oh, this is the other fucking weird part I forgot to tell you about. This is what happened. So the alibi 
For her? That she had, yeah. For the night that she was there. She was staying with Susan's parents. What? I know. That was so weird. And they don't explain why. <laughs> or like if they had had a relationship before that. But yeah. that's like real? Oh no, they know it's real. They talked to Susan's parents. But like why the fuck would she be there? I don't know. She hated this woman supposedly. And then you're staying the night at her parents' house? That, yeah. is, that was just like the weirdest fucking thing. Super weird. But so they're they're doing this interview with her after she's been put away in jail. Because spoiler alert, guys, she's fucking guilty as fuck. Yeah. Um, and we all know. So she goes away. She goes to jail. And while they're doing the trial, they're showing her. And I don't know. It reminded me of somebody who, like, doesn't know social cues. Again, narcissist yeah. kind of thing. Where, like, they're trying to pretend how normal people would act in this situation. But she's really overdoing it. She's, like, twitching and shaking. And, like, getting super pissed when it's, like, supposed to be sad. She's, like, yeah. the jury's, like, we were watching her the whole time. And half of the reason we all were, like, yeah, we got to convict her. This bitch is guilty as fuck. Is because she was, like, getting fucking irate. At yeah. The whole thing. And they were, like, I could for sure see how she would have anger issues to lead her to do this. So when they say that she's found guilty, she, likes is, like, seizing almost and sobbing into her arms like full on just too much yeah you know what i'm saying um and then when they do this interview with her she's super fucking weirdo (laughs) and she's like um do you think i'm stupid if i wanted to murder my husband do you think i would be dumb enough to ask a bunch of teenage kids like my husband taught me how to be a hunter he was a hunter i didn't like guns but he taught me how to shoot and i was a really good shot if i wanted him dead don't you think i could have just staged a hunting accident I was like, bitch, <laughs> that sounds like somebody who's thought about multiple options. Yeah. Why the fuck would you even say that? Yeah. So, and also, why didn't you just do that then? Because exactly. Then who's going to talk? Not the teenagers, you idiot. I know. Well, that's what it sounded to me like somebody who had been in jail and been like, damn, how, what could I have done instead? Yeah. <laughs> why would you even say that? Um. So she refuses to comment on the case. She's living with Reagan, her daughter. They're staying in the house, by the way. His house? His that house built? that he was murdered in. in. Oh, my God. Yes. Oh, my God. Yep. Um, Chuck is transferred. He's permanent custody of his father's sister now. Um, Brooke goes to a technical college in the Madison area. And then, let's see. Sorry. I'm trying to find. Okay, so at the end, Joshua Yankee pleads guilty to second degree intentional homicide and he's sentenced to 18 years in prison. Dang. Just for going in and unplugging the fucking phone. Yeah. So that's why we don't do murder, children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Listen, or, learn. Yeah. Um, Douglas Vest was offered a plea deal. And he turned it down because he was like, I think that I'm innocent because I didn't shoot anybody. Um, So I think I'll be fine. I'm going to take my chances. Well, that backfires because he's found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. (sighs) They gave him a choice. They were going to do 13 years. Oh, life in prison. He was like, "Mm, I'll take my chances Uh with life. Yeah. With life, homie. I wouldn't. Why? I wouldn't. Your Damn. chances are that good. He will not be eligible for parole until he has served 25 years of a sentence. Dang. Michael Maldonado is found guilty of first degree murder and is sentenced to life in prison. He will not be fi- he will not be eligible for for parole until he has served 50 years of a sentence. So he was charged. That 15 year old was charged as an adult. Yes. Well, they were all obviously, but yes. the other ones were older. Yeah, he was he the was the trigger guy. He yeah. pulled the trigger, so they charged him as an adult. Yeah. Um, Diane is found guilty of first degree murder and is sentenced to life in prison and will not be eligible for Jesus eligible for parole until she has served 45 years of her sentence by that time being no less than 86 years of age. Dang. All three of those, not Yankee, but the other three have appealed since then and all appeals have been denied. Yeah. And that is the murder of Ruben by Diane. Burkhart and her accomplices who my, were high school children. My God. So I have screenshots of the message, I believe. So in case you guys didn't aren't part of the exclusive, I'll read this again for you. 
It says, hometown scandal for you. I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin, a place where not a lot of spicy things happen. But when something does happen, it's usually huge and talked about for years after the event. In the mid-90s, a teacher's aide slash study hall monitor at the high school I eventually attended hired three of her students to kill her husband, who was planning to divorce her. This event was so crazy for our small town that a movie was made about it. The movie is called Seduced by Madness. I didn't get a chance to it's watch like a that. a mini-series. Because it's a mini-series and it was long as fuck. And yeah. I couldn't find it anywhere except for like Amazon Prime. I had to pay for it. So. Yeah. Fast forward to when I'm in high school. I've watched the movie and done plenty of Googling on this lady. This event comes up in my AP English class and my teacher pulls out an old yearbook and shows the entire class Diane Borkart, the lady who hired the kids, <clears throat> and told us the story of the day the police came to the school. They arrested her in the fucking school. Insane. Marched into the study hall room and arrested her. All the teachers lined the hallway and watched her get escorted by the cops. Wild. Wild. Wild times. So there you go. Again, to just reiterate, this is why we don't do murder kids. I know. So <laughs> Please don't do that. Yeah. Don't That's... even talk about doing it. No. I even Oh, because... One of the things I was going to say was that she said when she found out about the affair, I'm so angry I could kill him. Oh, And well. the daughter tells that. Like, she kept saying, I'm so angry I could murder him. I could kill him. And <laughs> yikes. Yikes. Well, thanks for hanging out with us, guys. Thanks for sitting through and um, understanding the, you know, just life shit of yes. the beginning of this. <laughs> yeah. And, uh that's that's the that on whatever all that and stuff yep okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll see you next week all right we're out bye <laughs>